Hello, everyone, and welcome, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. I think you are in for a fun and a very important conversation today about a topic that you hardly want to talk about, but you almost can never avoid. Uh, the professors John Danner and Mark Coopersmith call it the other F word, uh, and you guessed it, it is failure. And within the next 20 minutes or so, I think they are very likely to convince you not only to fully embrace it, but to understand why, you know, that's probably been the aspect of our life that, that we have been missing. John and Mark are distinguished voices at Cal Berkeley. Both John and Mark have been entrepreneurs, teach advanced entrepreneurship, advise entrepreneurs. So you're hearing it from the individuals who are actually in the game. The brilliant new book's called The Other F Word, as you can see there. So, gentlemen, great to be with you. Hey, it's great to join you, Mo. Likewise. You guys are smack dead in the epic center of entrepreneurship. So you're cheating in writing this book. However, when you take a look at the research that you guys have done, what have you learned about the smartest startups that you've been around or that you've advised, just say in the last three or four years? Well, one of the things that, that distinguishes really successful startups is the degree to which they can balance their enthusiasm and passion for what they're doing with the humility of recognizing that at least until they get it right, they're more likely to get it wrong uh, very, very frequently. And the sooner they can begin to accommodate the lessons that failure is teaching them. Because what is failure in the final analysis? It's kind of reality's way of telling you what you don't know and still need to know in order to succeed. And those companies that embrace that and begin to think of failure not as just a random event, but as a strategic resource that can drive growth, that can spur innovation, and can anchor employee engagement, uh, are really the ones that are going to be the winners, both in the short and the long term. Yeah, and, and let me add to that, because with startups in particular, we see failure really playing two key roles. Number one, it's the reason the opportunities exist in the first place, because either the existing incumbents failed to meet a market need, or they failed to see an emerging need and respond to it properly. So the fact that that opportunity is there for these startups to address is the first failure. And then secondly, startups fail all the time, and it's through that rapid iteration. You said we're here in Silicon Valley, kind of ground zero, which is where this concept of learning from your failures, lean startup, really emerged. So failure plays a key role in helping these startups adapt to the market and grow. Our shorthand for that process is your screw up became my startup. And I love it. How about the ones, the startups that you've been around maybe that haven't been so smart to recognize that? Have you seen any recurring patterns that are worth addressing? Yeah, there's several. Um, the first one is falling too much in love with either your strategy or your product uh, and staying with it for too long. Um, I mean, every new product, every new strategy is essentially an experiment. And the difficulty is that we sometimes don't use that language. When you use the term experiment, we kind of expect failures to go along with the process of discovery. Or negative outcomes. So or negative outcomes. We don't even call right. them failures. It's a positive and negative outcome. So that process of experimentation is really one that says we are learning new things, whatever happens. And that's what startups do. So some of the ones that fail actually fail because they, they cling so tenaciously to their original ideas, which is not to say that sometimes that's not the way to go. We, we like to say that sometimes it's better to rivet than pivot, and you've got to decide which way you need to go. It may be that the market needs more time to get used to your solution. You need to do a better job of explaining it and convincing users and customers to try it out. And it also may be that what they're telling you is, in fact, what you need to really listen to and pivot and change your direction. Yeah, so, so whether we're working with graduate students in our courses here in business engineering from around the world or executives that we also advise, one of the key things that we say kind of in the first week of any curriculum is get out of the building, go talk to customers, talk to competitors, look at what others are doing and see what the market is saying to what you're thinking about in case you're about to fail. Yeah, those words ring in our ears, right? We've heard Steve and Eric talk about those, but they make so much sense. But, you know, let me just deviate from that for a moment. How is it, it's really hard not to fall in love with your idea. That's why I get into a startup in the first place, right? So how do you convince me mentally that 
treat it as an experiment and have the willingness to just ditch it. It's not as easy as it sounds. So, so if you would, do, and then you mentioned something earlier around patterns that I'd love to come back to as well because we'll talk about that. Go ahead. Ben. Yeah, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, first is you got to have some diversity around the table, and you've got to encourage really open dialogue and challenging of assumptions. If it's just you talking to yourself in the mirror, guess what? You think you're the wisest person in the world, uh, and nobody's there to really challenge that that assumption. So start by having people who don't think like you, may not look like you, don't read the same things, don't necessarily go to the same websites, etc. Because that, out of that diversity can come the kind of candor and the kind of challenging and better thinking uh, that you won't get if you're just talking to yourself. Yeah, and one of the things that we saw consistently with startups small and then also as they scaled is that a number of them, Google among them and others, just do a wonderful job in processing negative outcomes or failures. And they focus on the what and the why and the how before they focus on, okay, who did it? So it's more about what did we learn from this and how can we put it to work as opposed to who do we need to banish to the corner office or even worse. And we saw there was another example that we cite in the book. Twitter, for example, uh, was one of those companies that people wondered for a long time, would they come up with a sustainable business model? And what they've done is they have these fantastic meetings at Twitter where whatever the outcome of these new product development initiatives are, they share them among the teams and they say what worked, what didn't, what can we learn? And through some of those, they got much better at monetizing the traffic that they had, among other things. By the way, the second, the second main reason is look at the data. Uh, the fact is that the survival statistics for startups are not encouraging. Most startups fail. Uh, most venture capital startups fail. Um, so you've got to ask yourself going in, okay, I'm smart, I'm gutsy, I've got a great idea. How am I going to beat those odds? Chances are you're going to beat those odds by paying much closer attention to what the market is telling you, what your colleagues are telling you, because they, they, they don't so much question the fundamental vision of the business. What they oftentimes are telling you or beginning to teach you is, here are some different ways in which we can get to that ultimate objective. And that's where the other F word again comes in because like it or not, the other F word is really an objective indicator that you may not be as smart as you thought, that you may not know everything you need to know. And let's get back to the business of trying to fix what needs to get fixed rather than continuing to ha hammer our heads against the wall. So Mark, so when you look at the, when you look at the founders in your part of the world, intellectually, there's probably very little difference, right? It's their execution, the ability to execute, their execution wise, there's probably the ones who fall into this category that appreciate this negative and positive outcome are probably able to execute better because of that mentality than the other ones who don't. I assume that's a pattern that's developing with the ones who really do make it through. Yeah, so, so thanks for coming back to that because what was fascinating is we looked at hundreds of businesses and interviewed and spoke with hundreds of executives in business, but also in other disciplines, from astronauts to cartoonists. We spoke with Scott Adams of Gilbert fame, who has his own view on all of these things, yeah. uh, to governors of states. What we found was key patterns, and patterns of those individuals, large organizations and small organizations that did a better job processing failure, which is really you know the question that you had there. And we, we actually codified it into the seven-stage failure value cycle that says, all right, from beginning to end, what are some of the ways that you can do a better job acknowledging failure and processing it and then remembering it so you don't make the same mistakes again so that you learn from them and that you minimize their impact? And you know, we're glad to spend a little time, if we'd like to, going through those seven steps with an example or two along the way. No, oh, it's, it's on my list for sure. You know, but one of the things we learned and one of the great takeaways from your work, both scientifically and philosophically, is that this whole F word starts with a mindset. If you can wrap your mental, you know, psychology around it, you will get through it and it'll become part of your life. I assume that's the context we're trying to send to everybody. Yeah, the, if, if I were going to summarize it into two words, I think the two words would be confident humility because it's the balance between both of those that really is the, is the key here. The humility to, to acknowledge the fact that 
the failure is the one resource that we are all expert at creating. Most organizations, especially startups, tend to create failures every day in all kinds of unpredictable ways. But you don't want to be you don't want to be traumatized by it. You don't want to wallow in failure, and you don't necessarily want to celebrate failure for its own sake. What you really want to do is liberate it to be the resource that can improve your decision making, and that's where the confidence comes in. Yeah, and in fact, I would say we've got three H's. We have humility, we have honesty in dealing with it, and then we have humor, which is also one of those elements that can be another way to to kind of break down some of the tension that people have around actually discussing some of those failures that they've had. In fact, one of the things that we do for leaders is we suggest that they be honest in sharing a failure or two, that maybe they inject a little bit of humor, and uh, of course, then there's a certain element of humility that's inherent in that. And those are elements that are a nice way to kind of circle this topic from a leadership standpoint. A great example of that is a fellow named Chris Michael, who's one of the folks featured in the book, The Intelligent Entrepreneur. Uh, Chris is a successful serial entrepreneur. And what he told us in our interview is he said he starts all of his startup teams with exactly the kind of session that Mark was talking about. He, lo he talks about his own bloopers, basically, and he does it with a note of self-effacing humor. And pretty soon people are laughing. And his whole motivation behind that is to basically give his team the permission to be more open about the failures and mistakes that they and together are going to be making so that they can shorten that cycle between the time that a mistake or an outcome that happened that, that really does matter to the firm and what they can do about it is as short as possible. Yeah, in fact, Mo, we're going to lead by example on this. So the book's been out a week now. Are you going to tell them this? Yeah, I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this. And, and we've, we have been... This is included. one of these. Yeah. We've included a, a mistake or two maybe in the manuscript, a typo here or whatever. And really in, in the spirit of, of being true to the ethos here, on the book's web page, we are going to put a list of all of the failures, mistakes, and bloopers that are in the book. So if anybody finds things, let us know, and we'll put it up on the website. And I know you, I know you that's coming from the heart, you know, so it's great. What, there's a couple of things that just emerged from that, Mark. And, you know, I, I recall the days that Eric got on in the, the, the Lean Startup philosophy launch. And we've been very, we've yeah. been oh, yeah. very active in that, very yeah. from, the, from the first conference, to the one that we had just a few months ago. And one of the things that's obvious there is not only obviously it's full of entrepreneurs, but the enterprise companies that are starting to be part of this movement. General GE has been part of it for several years. Into it's big part of it. We're starting to see some big movement. When you speak to large enterprises, how do they start to internalize that message? Because you're talking to a different animal there, right? Going back to that whole elephant, how do you deal with it? That that's such. Well, let me start and then go ahead. That's such a uh, such a huge issue for many enterprises, just because they're not wired that way. You know, they're wired to execute. They're wired not to experiment. It's one of the reasons why there some of them we see them falling off those heavy those those high growth paths, and a lot of that comes down to does does leadership really embrace failure in the way we're talking about? Does it look at it as experiments? And when there is a failure, do they also bring people in and say, look, we've got some insights from it. Let's restart this and have those same team members lead the next initiative so that you can show that there's life after a failure. In fact, one of the ways we like to look at this is there are, there are, are some cultures that instead of really focusing on trial and error, have much more of a trial and terror mentality. And if that's the case, of course, if you're not willing to try, you're not willing, if you don't try, you're not going to innovate. And if you do try, sometimes you will fail. So there's some natural math that goes with that as well. But at the same time, uh, although scale poses its own challenges to large organizations trying to both stay vibrant and innovate in the way that Mark was talking about, there also are some very fundamentally common elements here. Uh, we've done a lot of speaking before senior executive teams in major organizations all over the world. And one of the things that comes back time and time again in the audience reaction to our talks about this is we can't even talk about failure uh, in our organization. We can't use the term. 
And that's one of the reasons why we called the book the other F word, because it really is in many organizations more of a taboo than a legitimate topic of discussion and focus among senior executives. So just as we're suggesting for startups, the importance of beginning that conversation, the other F word conversation in the way that Mark was talking about, is every bit as important for large organizations. Because in most organizations, people will look up before they look sideways or down to see what's okay to do, what's okay to talk about. And if a CEO and the senior team can show that they're comfortable with, indeed may welcome failure on the way to success, it's a lot easier for the rest of the organization where many of those other failures are occurring to be as open as they see those folks in the big offices with the C titles behind them uh, are as well. Yeah. Can, can I share a brief story of, of one of the key motivations that really Please. led us, and, and insights that led us to write this book? So we had been teaching a class by the same name and gave a number of talks, um, both together and then John on the East Coast and, and me up and down the West Coast. And what was fascinating is after those talks, as opposed to the usual people walk up and say, geez, that was great, I'd love to talk to you about it. There was polite applause, and that was about it. And then one by one in the reception afterward, we said, we thought this was well received, but one by one in the reception afterward, people would come up and do, say exactly what John said. We can't have this conversation in our company. It's an uncomfortable discussion or topic for us. And for us, we said, then we have to bring it out into the open, and we have to find a better way to discuss it and to turn it from something that hides in the corners into the strategic resource that failure really can be. Yeah, and that's what one of the motivations that led us to this book, because uh, as we've seen, you've seen, you know, I'm sure your viewers uh, and readers have noticed there are a lot of things out there talking about failure. Uh, and as we look through the, uh, the other literature, yeah, that's right. what we found is that there's one category, kind of the hoorah category. You know, I struggled, I persevered, I succeeded. And those are inspiring stories, but they're very hard to put, put in place practically when you get back to your job on Monday morning. There's another whole set, which is kind of the hoopla approach, which is the Silicon Valley fail off and fail fast. And we like that too, but we think people kind of know that instinctively. Um, and the last category is kind of the self-help category, kind of the blah, blah category to some extent. Uh, and, and while that can be useful on an individual basis, it's sometimes hard to translate that in a collaborative culture in most organizations. So our approach was to try to do a book that focused more, as the subtitle suggests, how do you practically put failure to work in your organization, whether you're a startup, whether you're a small and medium grow up kind of company, or whether or not you're a large grown up enterprise. Uh, and that's the angle that we've tried to take. And fortunately, that's the kind of reaction that we're getting from readers around the world. Yeah, the practicality, the pragmatic approach, how to put it to work. We even have a report card in the book, and you can also get it for free on the website, that lets, that helps you rate your own organization and yourself and say, are you failure savvy, which is a term that we coined to say organizations and leaders that really understand how to leverage failure. Yeah, the last thing in the world we want is our readers to flunk failure. Yeah. <laughs> so here's something that is just hit you like a brick right at the beginning of the book. When you say that failure can be a force multiplier, you just talked about how challenging it is for organizations to even have a conversation around failure. If they understand that missteps or failures, or however you want to call it, can be the link to this exponential growth that they're looking for, I would think that would trigger a curiosity enough to say, let's at least listen. Well, that's, that's exactly why we talk about it as a strategic resource rather than a regret. I mean, yeah, we all regret failures. And very few people really want to embrace failure on its own sake. Uh, but if you can begin to say, well, wait a second, we've just spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort among some of our most talented people pursuing ideas that we believed in, that we thought were going to be successful, and they weren't for some reason or another. We've paid that resource. Why not capture the benefit of the insights and lessons that come out of the failure that we unfortunately encounter? And that's where this, this interplay between failure and the fear and memory of failure becomes so important to understand. Because if you think about just your own life, what do we remember? Most of us tend to remember those failures in some ways even more than we remember 
successes. Absolutely. This came out of our class uh, here at the business school. We asked students to think about it over the course of a semester. And one of the students came back and said, you know what, it's like the half-life of failure is a whole lot longer than the half-life of success. And everybody started nodding their heads. We vividly remember those disappointments, the times when, when we failed. We feel it personally, intensely. If managers and executives and leaders can begin to help people end failures more positively and more productively, you can go a long way to reduce the negative impact of the fear of failure in the first place, which just stifles creativity and risk taking, the very oxygen that you need to fuel the next stage of growth for your organization. And by doing that, you can release this multiplier effect, this force multiplier that failure represents. Do you think we're in an era where this generation, Mark, almost kind of demands this type of culture? I mean, it's where they're, I mean, they're growing up in that environment at schools like Berkeley and obviously next door at Stanford. Do they go into these larger organizations if they ever choose to go into those organizations almost demanding this type of philosophy or they're not going to stay? That's, you know, that's what we would believe. I mean, that's obviously what we put forward. And, and beyond that, we actually did a lot of work with uh, the Great Place to Work Institute to try and really get under the, the skin on that one and understand that question. And one of the biggest issues that came up was when you talk about having engaged employees, to your point, employees that really want to be there and will give everything to their workplace, the number one indicator, the number one factor that drives employee engagement is trust. So we looked at that and we spent some time going through the numbers on that and we said, what, where does trust really get created? And trust gets created not when everything is going well, but when things don't quite go the way you expect them to, then what happens? What do your coworkers do? What does your boss do? How does that failure get processed? Uh, and if the failure gets processed in a productive and positive way, if there's a positive engagement with what happens, then trust grows, employee engagement grows. Obviously the converse also takes place and when you take a look at those companies like the Googles of the world that consistently rate at the very top of that great place to work rankings, the way that they handle failure is similarly productive. So there's really a direct correlation between what you just asked about employee engagement and retaining the best and brightest and how process, how failure is processed and trust created. Yeah, students want what most of us want in, in their workplace. They want to be respected, they want to be listened to, they want to be given opportunity to try things. And you can't be genuine about that if you're not prepared to dance with the other F word. Yeah. So, so there is one issue though that is interesting when we talk about it. And, you can kind of see fear going across many executives' faces, and that is, are we going to get all soft and gooey in this topic about fear of failure and, you know, how to deal with it? And the answer is no. You know, that's why we kind of created our seven-step cycle, why we've got specific ways to engage in it and turn it into a, research, into a resource. So we don't look at it as self-help, although we feel that if you embrace it well, you get that. But this is an organizational tool.